After the failure of the MBT-70 program in 1978, the British Army started developing MBT-80. Unfortunately, by 1980, it became obvious that a tank was not going to enter service until the 1990s. In the meantime, there was a concern that the qualitative superiority of chieftain over their Warsaw Pact opposition was no longer sufficient to counter the quantitative superiority of Warsaw Pact over NATO. An interim tank project was started. Now, this wasn't going to be a chieftain replacement. The two tanks were going to serve side by side, and indeed, the arrival of the new tanks meant that the Royal Armoured Corps could actually expand, and a new regiment was to be stood up. The MBT-80 project itself was axed, but a lot of the work that was done will be used in the successor program, which was started. Because the tank, which would eventually become Challenger, was just a stopgap, it made sense to keep the cost as low as possible by leveraging work which had already been done. Turned out the work had already been done on Shear 2, a derivative of Shear 1, also for the Iranian army, and it was a foundation of Khalid, which was the Jordanian army's version of a product-improved chieftain. So first you change the engine, then you change the armor and suspension, that sort of thing. To show you the similarity between Shear 2's project and Challenger's project, the FV code for Shear 2 was FV4030-3, and the FV code for Challenger is 4030-4. And indeed, some of the paperwork for this particular tank references it as a Shear 2. As the work had already generally been done, the development timeline was extremely quick. Announcement was made in Parliament in July 1980 of this new project, and by early 1982, prototypes had started being delivered. Seven of the prototypes were made. This is one of them behind me here at the US Army's Armor and Cavalry Collection in Fort Benning. There are a couple of giveaways that this is a prototype vehicle, most specifically the lack of a TOGS box on the right-hand side of the turret. If the vehicle hadn't been repainted, you would see a registration plate with SP, Special Project, in the middle. Now, I should say this was repainted in a hurry in Fort Knox before the move to come over here. So nobody's incredibly happy with the way it's been painted. So they're going to have to repaint it back to British colors, scrape off the paint that is on the lenses and so on. It's a task. They will be doing it and they'll also be cleaning out the inside a bit more. There are other differences between this and the production vehicle. Unfortunately, I only have the manual for the production vehicles. And as I've already started doing a quick recon around the tank, I found a few other differences that we're going to get to, especially when we get inside. But since I don't have access to an operational level Challenger 1, this will do in the meantime. So we will begin as normal at the front. And we're going to start at the bottom. This is a lashing eye. It is not to be used for towing. The manual has big block writing saying do not use for towing. You're supposed to use these two for towing. And for lifting, well, you got your lifting eyes on each corner. Tracked engine! Aha, I'm going to get ahead of the game here. Undo these bolts, remove this locking plate, and you can then use a really large track adjusting wrench. It's actually kind of an S shape to clear the, the bow here. So it is a special wrench. Once you have it tensioned accordingly, uh, lock it in place with your locking plate, bolt that down, and you are good. On production vehicles, there would be fire extinguishers on the two fenders. There's a horn just outboard of the light behind the guards here. As you come a little bit further back, there would be a splash guard, or in the manual, a splash rail coming all the way across. You see the driver's hatch, front and center, complete with windshield wipers and windshield spray to keep things clean. This hatch does not appear to be a service hatch because the manual has instructions on how to get one of these things open from the outside. It involves hammering with a shear pin to break the lock, basically, and then you're able to lift it up and outwards. So if you ever do find an unattended Challenger 1 that seems to be locked, it can be opened from the outside. Coming around, you'll also see the mounting points for the rear view mirrors. They are detachable. Side lights, rubber fenders, and, well, that's basically the front. The idler wheel you can see is not the same as the road wheels, but they do have the same lubrication system. This is a filler plug, so you actually pull it out, you unscrew it, you pull it out, and there's, for lack of a better word, a tray that you pour your fluid into when the tray gets up 
filled up to a certain level, you push the plug back in, screw it in place, and you're done. Same with the road wheels. The tracks, single pin, 92 links per side. Although as the track stretches, you can remove links until it comes down to 87, at which point if you're fully extended at 87 links per side, you need to replace the track. The rubber track pads also are individually replaceable. There are two bolts, one each side of the center guide. They're 68 centimeters wide. The whole system will cross a 2.8 meter trench and climb a 90 centimeter wall. Now, also back here, you can see the hydrograph suspension unit. Now, they've gone from the old Chieftain bogies to an independent suspension. And one of the nice things about hydrogas is that it only takes up as much room inside the hull as is required by the bolts holding each individual unit into place. So, quite convenient. It's almost like a one wheel bogey. To actually perform the suspension function, there is a piston which goes all the way to the back. So it's hydraulic fluid on one side of the piston and that hydraulic fluid kind of dampens the oscillations. And on the other side of the piston at the far end is high pressure nitrogen. So as the wheel goes up, the nitrogen gets compressed and that counteracts the upward motion of the wheel. Well, this then means that for maintenance purposes, all you need is something to plug into the valve at the far end of the piston with a bottle of high pressure nitrogen. Fill that back up and you're good. An interesting quirk with the suspension, though, is that it ride height varies depending on how warm the suspension is. So overnight, the tank will actually settle. And then when you get going again, it'll start to rise, which is an interesting problem for the world of track tensioning, which is usually measured between the first and second return rollers at one to two inches. But if your suspension is cold, and especially if you're expecting to do some hard cross-country running, the manual says you're supposed to tension for three to four inches of sag between the two return rollers because that's how much the suspension is going to rise and stretch the track as it warms up. Oh, as an aside, the little bulge at the bottom, that's a sump for lubrication oil. So coming upwards, the side skirting apparently is aluminium because my magnet that I use for my lighting inside doesn't uh, hold on to it. And it makes sense considering you're supposed to take this on and off for maintenance relatively frequently. It's held on in place by the bolts at the top. Underneath there's just a little hook and latch onto the support arm. So you under the bolts, pull it out a little bit, then up and set it aside. I note that the nut for this bolt is welded in place. I don't know if that's design feature or just something that was done, but it is actually a neat idea because it means that it's one less thing to go missing when you pull the bolt out. Fire extinguisher handle, there's one on the far side as well. Come back under the gun tube. So it is a canvas slash fiberglass combination gun shroud, and it is a thermal sleeve. I think it's the first tank to come across that has one in these videos. The function is it evens out the temperature inside the gun, or actually of the gun. So by way of experiment uh, or example, Let's say the sun is beating hot, the gun gets hotter, all the metal expands, then it starts to rain. The rain lands on the top, that will contract the metal on the top, which means that the gun will bow upwards. And so the thermal shroud is designed to even out the expansion of the gun. Plus there's the muzzle reference sensor at the end, which is used for alignment, I'll talk about that inside, and the bore vacuum, sorry, fume extractor, because it's English. So we keep coming past. This bin is usually for a camouflage net, smoke grenade launchers. Around, say around here, there is inside the, uh, behind the road wheels, so hopefully I get a shot of it, a refuse ejection port. It's about yay big, looks a bit like a pistol port. And it is designed for you to be able to throw stuff out of the tank that you don't need anymore, where, especially when you're sealed up in NBC conditions. And there is a bag, that, a zipper bag that is used to kind of be an airlock effect. Uh, I can't imagine what sort of refuse you will be that much of a hurry to throw out when you're sealed in a tank for several days in NBC conditions. Tow cable, okay, fair enough. Uh, these, these confuse the heck out of me for much time. So they're ordinarily black, and you see them on Chieftain as well. And you know the way I say, whenever you're making a model, always ask yourself, what the devil is it for? Well, in this case, it turns out these are rubber bumpers 
that if you're traversing the gun, uh, too much depression, in manual depression, uh, it'll bump off the bumper and not cause any damage. Keep coming back to the exhaust pipes, or exhaust ports, there's one on each side. Initially the louvers aimed a little bit more upwards, but there was a change and I guess this one somehow got the later ones added, modified to come sideways. There are canvas shrouds that come for these exhaust ports, so if it's raining or if you're going through the wash rack and you don't want the water to get inside the exhaust system, you affix the canvas shroud to the outside and you're good. Stowage bin, fuel filler port, and then you come around the back. Sadly, the back of the tank has been destowed, which is a shame because it's actually rather interesting on the real Challenger. So reflector, tail light, and then an electrical connector for whatever it is that you're towing. An infantry telephone box could be found usually on the left rear. Jerry cans, one on each side of the gun crutch, or in American, travel lock. Final drive filler port back here. These are not lifting eyes. These are more lashing points for tying the vehicle down to a trailer or flat car. The actual lifting eyes are inside the hull. I'll show you when we get upstairs if I can open up the, the louvers. I'm a little bit surprised because looking at this spare track block and the pin that they have here, it seems to me like it's dead track because I don't see any evidence of any bushings that will be found on live track. So unless a chieftain or a challenger crewman can correct me, this looks really old school. Now, your towing points down here. On a service challenger one, you would likely see a bar go all the way across. It's part of the towing bar system and it's semi-permanently attached. When you do have to tow another tank, all you have to do is just unbolt it, it swivels down you already have one part of the frame also on this bar. You have to get the other part of the frame off of your towy tank and, or the towed tank, I guess. Put them together and you can now tow whatever your other tank is. So it's actually pretty quick and a clever way of doing things. There would be a convoy marker light system. Uh, then you come around to the right hand side and well, more lights. Now, if you're going to tow a vehicle any length of distance at all, you need to disconnect the final drives. And in this vehicle, you use what is called a muff decoupling tool. It is uh, basically, it looks like one of those old hand drills. Insert in here and you simply crank around until it extends out to the towing position or the disconnected position. And that, of course, completely disconnects the drives from the rest of the drivetrain, so there's no, uh, there's no rolling resistance. It doesn't put pressure or strain on the parts. All is good. Okay, so ordinarily when I get to the engine deck, I do a couple of things. First, I comment about how nice it is to sleep on, and... Uh, secondly, I will then rattle off a whole series of figures or specifications, which usually takes me several edits and tries. And A, I don't have the time, and B, the British did not make this easy. So I am just going to read from the notes. If you think I do this off the cuff, I don't. And unfortunately, the teleprompter is too far away for me to use, so maybe I need a bigger teleprompter. The engine is the Rolls-Royce VC12 TCA 1200 number 3 Mark 4A. That basically, it's a twin turbo, 26.1 liter V12 diesel, puts out about 1200 horsepower. Now, it's electronically controlled, so when you push down on the accelerator pedal, the signal is sent to the main engine control unit that's located kind of forward of the bulkhead. That then, in conjunction with a couple of uh, sensors, uh, controls the fuel injection, the governor, and the inlet manifold heater. The whole system, of course, uh, engine, uh, transmission, the, the, the whole pack, comes in about five and a half tons and is, of course, easily enough replaced. There are three fuel filters and four oil filters located at the front end of the engine. Now, unfortunately, in order to change them, you've got to pull the engine deck itself, which seems a little bit inconvenient. Uh, the manual also notes that they are extremely susceptible to damage, so be careful. All right, so let's see, what else have we got here? Uh, 91 liters of oil are used. Coolant capacity, so that's one of the two radiators here, and you can see it's hinged at the bottom. 
Now, unfortunately, I would need to remove some of the locks here, but it, it, if you have the tool, it's presumably an easy, rem uh, easy flip. So the locking latch back here, the radiator will then rotate upwards to the 90 degrees, so straight up, so you can then access anything below the radiator. Uh, the air itself is drawn in through the top, through the three fans, two for the uh, engine radio, one, uh, radiator, one for the oil cooler, and then out the back. There is an auxiliary motor located forward and left. According to the, the notes, it is a Coventry Climax H30 number four Mark 18H. The British need to simplify their naming system, I'm sorry. Fuel system, now that's eight storage tanks. There are four storage tanks per side. There are two filler ports per side. So as you fill up uh, the, the one tank on the side, it'll eventually fill up all the others. Now, because it takes a little while for this cross connect to fill, it's recommended that you actually do both fuel filler ports at the same time. So there's one in the back corner I mentioned earlier, and there's also one slightly forward and left. Although the engine will feed off of both tanks because it's cross connected, you can't fill both sides at the same time. You've, you've got to open up all four hatches and fill them up all four together. The fuel tanks themselves, they go all the way forward along the fenders, pretty much up to the driver's position. So there's a lot of fuel in here. In fact, it is 1,797 liters, of which 1,592 is usable. Oh, there you go. To the rear of the transmission is a TN37. It's four speeds forward, three in reverse. Now it's called a transmission, but it is also the steering system, the braking system, and it's all controlled electronically by the GCA, the gear controller automatic, which is forward in the driver's hole. By the way, speaking of the brakes, as I recall, there are 18 or 19 discs per side for the brakes. Finally, the turret roof. Now this is a stowage bin on the Challenger production variants. The back end of the turret is a bit different, but something that you will see is a really large hinge at the back left corner. And what this allows is for the entire rear of the turret wall to open up. That gives you access for maintenance for the MBC system. The hatch that is open, that's for the two turret batteries, 12 volts. They are wired, wired in series. That gives you 24 volts, obviously. And it's enough juice to run the turret in silent watch without using the auxiliary motor for up to eight hours. A beacon for those road marches in continental Europe where you've got to have the flashy light. Commander's cupola, Lotus cupola uh, hatch, nothing unusual. Forward of the Commander's cupola, you're going to see the little triangular hatch is flipped open. That is the housing for the auxiliary site. So it's spring-loaded, you need two people to close it, which is probably why it's open right now. But when you flip the release handle, the hatch springs open to the left as it is, and then you can extend the auxiliary site, which you can see is extended. Right. That about brings us to the end of the tour part one. So hope you found it interesting and informative and I will talk to you on part two. Take care. However, because the work was already done, it also meant... Because the tank, which would eventually become Challenger, was just a stopgap, it made sense to keep the cost as low as possible. And it, they were going to leverage work that was... Uh, okay. To show you how closely related the developments were, the code for uh, the FE code for Shear 2 was a derivative of Shear 1, uh, which was the foundation for Khalid by uh, the Jordanian army, and that was the product improved chieftain. How many times do I need to do this? They're 68 centimeters wide. The whole system will cross a... 2.8 meter trench and climb a 90 centimeter wall. It was 2.8, damn it. Okay, unfortunately, there's no dignified way for me to do this because the camera tripod just isn't big enough. Yes, it is.